Hi y'all, in this video I will be uh, responding to a video uploaded by Maya Bialik, who is an actress and PhD neuroscientist. Uh, she uploaded a video discussing girl versus women, the terms girl versus the term women, and why language matters and how the term girl should not be used to be applied to women, by which she means uh, females who are adults versus females who are not adults. Anyway, uh, take it away, doctor. I'm going to be annoying right now because I want to talk about something that a lot of people don't want to talk about. I was recently at a bar with two guy friends who are about 40, and one of them said to the other, Oh my god, dude, look at that girl sitting at the bar. She's beautiful. And I start looking around, wondering why they would let a child into the bar. Then I realized that when he said girl, he meant woman. Okay, I wasn't there. I'm not privy to her internal thoughts. So the most that I can do is doubt that uh, such chain of thought actually happened. Uh, maybe it did, but if it did, the really pe peculiar part of this is uh, not that she wondered, gee, golly, how is it that a child managed to get past the bouncers and into this bar where you know people under age aren't allowed to be, but why is it, what she didn't think was, why is it that my friend is like grooving on this child who has managed to get past security? Uh, but, you know, it's holly weird, so I guess you have to have priorities, and what really matters is policing other people's language. Carry on, doctor. But since she's in that super narrow age range between 5 years old and 55 years old, we just don't know what to call her. So, we call her a girl. Sorry, folks, I have to do this. We have to stop calling women girls. Why? We have to change the dictionary, because... Someone's feelings dictate that this is so. The, the use of girl to apply to women, young women in particular, is not new, it is not novel, nor for that matter uh, is using boy to refer to adult men, uh, abnormal, unusual, new, or novel. These things have been with us for, oh, who knows how long. Uh, as far as I know, and as far back as I can trace in literature and in newsreels and, uh, and the like. It, one is a colloquial use by which the, the speaker does not mean, and no one but people who have a particular political persuasion that has recently come about in the West, uh, understand it to mean that the person is being likened to an actual child. Uh, we'll refer to, the, I'll, I'll get to this a bit later, but I just wanted to put a little marker here, just put down a little marker here, about something called the psychologist's fallacy, so named because of the prevalence, the preponderance of the activity in the psychological community, where there was, uh, a, the, the way it was phrased is that a particular snell to which the, su the psychologist is, is subject is a confusion between his standpoint and the existence of some mental fact about which he is writing a report. It is the confusion between the position of the observer, his or her own subjective views about the world, and what is going on in someone else's head, or the, uh, the truth about some fact in the world. Typically this means uh, some mental fact about some other person. Uh, we generally just call that projection. It's where you imagine that uh, what you would say or mean in a given situation is what another person must have meant uh, when they used those words. And it's going to be very interesting to see what, what Mayim here, the, the good feminist who cares about women and girls, actually thinks of girls. Which I, as an anti-feminist, would never ever say, and in fact I find it aberrant to think this way about uh, my fellow humans. But uh, we'll, we'll let the good doctor carry on. Because it matters what we call people. Language matters. Words have meaning. And the way we use words changes the way we frame things in our mind. Google Sapper Wharf, if you don't believe me. I did Google Sapper Wharf because I don't believe you. Real quick before I actually get to Sapper Wharf, whenever you read uh, studies from the social so-called sciences, I've discussed this more at length in other videos, but I'll just give a short version of it here. The safest course of action for you to do, as a general proposition, is to believe the complement of the conclusion of that study because if the replication studies are any indication that it attempts to go around and replicate uh, psychological studies, things in the social sciences more generally probably follow the same trend, or at least I, su I suppose that they do follow the same trend. But in any event, uh, this happens in, in the social so-called sciences, not so much in the hard sciences. Um, they will overstate their conclusions, they will misleadingly state their conclusions, or the conclusions will just be absolutely false. 
And this is all brought to you by the convenience of not adhering to such petty a concern, so petty a concern as scientific rigor. Now, when a person is citing one of these psychological studies, you can, for even better reasons, uh, believe the complement of the claim uh, rather than the claim itself, because the people who propose these propositions generally are doing it to support a politically driven uh, agenda, a politically driven ideology, as she is here doing. So when they, they go to the list of things that would be convenient to use that we can call science list, and they look at it, they will select from these studies, which, as I mentioned, are already dodgy on their own, but that dodginess is non-linearly magnified by the selection criteria of politically active ideologues and demagogues, incidentally, but putting that off to the side, who want to use these to push a particular social narrative and indeed to control your behavior. Now, on to the actual Sapper Wharf uh, little thing that she mentioned. I did go Google it. I would think that as a neuroscientist, that before you go advising other people to Google your work product and to see whether or not uh, it's true and the extent to which it's valid or invalid that you yourself would have done so and if you uh, did do so you would have noticed as it appeared on my screen that the first entry is the sapper Whorf hypothesis which a, a, a hypothesis is not science it is not part of the ex, ex cathedra program or enterprise of science it's something that it sounds reasonable I suppose or at least something that's interesting to be looked into and then you go to, uh, like, Wikipedia, and Wikipedia calls it the sapper Whorf hypothesis, I'm sorry, uh, theory, which has two forms, the strong and the weak. The strong form is that it's deterministic. These linguistic categories about which she's here repining determine our behavior and worldview. And then the weaker version is that it greatly influences the aforementioned properties. Now, the problem here, doctor, is that they did this little thing called research in the 80s, where they positively showed that it's not deterministic and that the influence, whatever it is, is non-trivial, which is a far cry from a great influence, and that it is restricted to only a small number of domains of mental life. It doesn't generalize. Now, um, the curious thing here is that they had to do research at all, experiments at all, to reach this conclusion. One of the great things about science is parsimony, Lex Parsimoniae, Occam's razor, uh, or Einstein's razor, as I prefer, because it makes explicit what's implicit in, in the idea of parsimony, that you make things as simple as you possibly can make them, but no simpler. Um, or, as Einstein actually said it in 1933, from which this paraphrase is taken, the actual quote goes something a little bit like this. It can scarcely be denied that the supreme goal of science is to, make the irre is to make irreducible basic elements as simple and as few as possible without surrendering, um, w without surrendering a single datum of experience. So the idea there is that you take account of everything that is known, you sacrifice none of it, and then what you do is you prefer the simplest explanation based on previous knowledge and, and whatnot. Now, here, we have to remember that we're talking about social creatures who are, which are evolved. And it does not take a great intellect to realize that we have behaviors that we still engage in that precede the existence of language. So whatever else is true about this hypothesis, the one thing that cannot be true is that it's causally related to what it is that we do because we have behaviors that don't depend on it and predate it. That in and of itself is sufficient to say that the, the claim that the, those put forth by Sapper and Worf, that th this claim about the determinism of it is just false. Now, it may have some influence, which is harder to test. And one of the things that, that happens very commonly in the social so-called sciences is that the way they go about doing these uh, so-called experiments is they devise them in such a way that it's not possible, generally, to distinguish between a measurement error of the instrument that they're using, the diagnostic sensitivity of the instrument which is being used to measure the thing, and an actual event. So uh, that's why I'm dubious to say the least of it whenever I get told these kinds of things. So I would think that after, you know, 30 some years, 30-ish years of it's being known that it's not determinist, that it doesn't deterministic, that it doesn't cause this, that you wouldn't go around saying that it changes it. Now you might say that it's not, that it has some influence here or there, 
but that's not a cause. It's neither necessary nor sufficient. It's a contributing factor in a minority of mental exercises, but that's not your claim. Your claim is much stronger than that and has been, uh, one, is logically dubious on the deterministic front and on the great influence front has, has been shown uh, not to uh, be evident when you actually go look at it. It's science. Oh, and real quick, all the great minds who, have, who really put forward the enterprise of science realize this, this, uh, this notion of parsimony, and they take it very seriously. And uh, Einstein was a great example of it. There are many others. I'll give you one other. A uh, personal uh, hero of mine is Richard Feynman, and the way that he really got the goose of helium scientists who were really getting confused about uh, um, superfluid helium. Uh, Leonard Susskind has a talk on this uh, about Richard Feynman, his basically a eulogy on TEDx, but he talks about what Feynman did. And what Feynman did is he bested them all using his own diagrams and being essentially Richard Feynman. And what he did there is simply is something that uh, is an exercise that we teach the students in calculus right away. It's something you pick up very early in your calculus career about using derivatives to recon derivatives of an integrals to reconstruct uh, various types of graphs to sketch graphs of possible uh, form of possible formulas and what you do is you look at the zeros boom boom those are your boundary conditions so if you think of a graph left side right side uh, I know where where it does where the pram um, sorry where the boundary conditions are and what it's doing there and now all I need to do is figure out what it does between the two Feynman looked at the parameters Okay, what are the conditions that must be satisfied? At the beginning of where I'm interested in studying it, it must be this. At the end of what I'm interested in studying, it must be this. And it does something in between the two. What is the one thing that it does between the two? You plot that, and then Feynman, Feynman solved that problem, besting all of the, the supposed experts in the field, solving all of their problems. And he did it on a lark, on a whim. Let me just see what I can do with this. If you take it seriously, and you really run with this idea you can use Occam's razor, Einstein's razor, whichever formulation of it you, you happen to prefer. You can use it to cut away nonsense very quickly. It's one of the failings of modern schooling systems here in the West is that it does not teach uh, logic as it should and doesn't teach statistics and probability the way that it should, uh, focusing on teaching people algebra and geometry, for example, which are important. I don't want to, I mean, as a mathematician, obviously I think those are extremely important, but as a practical everyday endeavor, it's going to be uh, more useful for people to have a good understanding of probability and statistics and logic than being able to sit there and do really fancy things with some circles and, and some various postulates. Just real world, trying to get through your life, you don't need to know trigonometry by and large, and you don't need to know geometry by and large. You need to understand probability and statistics because your failure to know it is how you are lied to very, very frequently by people who should know better, but because it doesn't, because reality is too inconvenient to their political narratives, can't be much asked to do the hard intellectual work of being honest. I digress. Take it away. So when we use words to describe adult women that are typically used to describe children, it changes the way we view women, even... Typically, but not exclusively. And no, it doesn't choose the way that we view uh, women. It may change the way that you view women, which I doubt because I watched a video about you and your son when he was playing the violin. Uh, by the way, really good with the instruments. Good job there. And you're talking about raising him and how it's important to play with your kids, and that's the kind of girl that you are. You didn't seem to have any confusion there that you are simultaneously uh, deserving of respect, strong, you know, blah, 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 equal dignity, all this other stuff, uh, while simultaneously being able to engage in that activity, which is curious, given something that you're going to say in a little while, which is related to the psychological fallacy, which I earlier mentioned, and let's let you get to it. Unconsciously, so that we don't equate them with adult men. In fact, it implies that they're inferior to men. No, that's what you feel. It is not what is implied by the proposition. When I'm called a boy, which does happen, uh, I don't think, oh my God, I'm being denigrated. Now, it's possible to use it that way uh, to highlight the fact that a person is, is being immature or having some trait about childhood that, that you tend to outgrow. But the interesting thing here is that when I look at a child and I see a little girl or a little boy running around being little girls and little boys doing whatever, I don't think, my word, there is an inferior creature to me. You, on the other hand, project and think, this is a sign of inferiority. Being a woman or a girl is not an inferior state of affairs to being a man 
or a boy. I'm sorry that you feel that way and that you need to project your feelings onto the remainder of society, but the fact that you feel that way does not map on to reality. And it's interesting here to talk about maps and terrain because it's useful, particularly given this linguistic uh, notion that notion of bullshit that you were giving, trying to feed us earlier. When I was in the army and when I was in law enforcement and someone was lost and we couldn't find out where they were, one of the jokes was just have them shake a tree while I look on the map and then I'll go locate them. Because the joke, the joke there is obvious and you know, you come up with silly shit when you're out in the field for two weeks and you don't have anything else to do so you find weird ways to view the world. And it's because a map and a terrain are two different things. Maps are supposed to map terrain and terrain is supposed to be reflected on a map. But of course we all know that not every map perfectly maps the terrain it's supposed to because they go out of date, things are changed, and there's a disconnect between the map and the terrain. And if you, and if you confuse the one for the other, you're in a world of hurt in the same way that you know, the, the punchline of that joke, the unstated punchline of that joke is, if you confuse the ability to shake a tree with changing what happens on the map, uh, these people who require to be rescued because they're lost are going to be fucked. Uh, best of luck to you. Uh, you, I hope you can. Yeah, I hope you have good survival skills because we're too stupid to figure out how to get to you because we think that if you shake a tree in the real world, that like an etch a sketch changes the map. It doesn't work that way, which is the fundamental problem with this. These linguistic categories being in some sense determinative uh, of what it is that we think, how we view the world, and behaviors in which we engage. It's just not true. We have behaviors that predate the existence of language, and therefore language cannot logically be at all causally related to those behaviors. We still engage in those behaviors, their origin predates the existence of language, and therefore is not controlled by it. Though there may be some, there may, and this is just a really gracious undertaking on my part to grant you that there's validity to this at all, there may be some circles in which linguistic categories are, in fact, uh, a contributing factor to how we view the world or the behaviors in which we engage. And that's my being, that's a very great sense of largesse on my part. You are welcome. That is the problem there though. Do not confuse a map for its terrain. Even if that's not what most people intend, words have an impact on our unconscious. Case in point, you would never say to someone, go ask that boy behind the bank counter if the notary's here today. We never... Well, I might not actually say that because when I go to my bank, the notaries don't send behind bank counters, but that's just a different, <laughs> that's a mere detail. What I do remember is when, say, I don't know, the United States, Canada, and some other countries were storming the beaches of Normandy, and there were, were reportings on various uh, killings of, of allied forces that the news reporters had no problems whatever talking about the American boys, our boys, the boys, they weren't boys. They were, they were actually men. They were, most of them, some of them were underage. Uh, they got in through lying because they wanted to be brave and go help fight the Nazis. And, you know, I congratulate and admire uh, those boys who were actually boys, you know, the underage ones, who were like, fuck this, not in my world. I don't care if there's such a trivial factor as my age standing between me and killing the Nazis to stop them. I'm going to tell a little fib to get in there to help go kill some Nazis. I applaud those boys for making a man's decision. <clears throat> so there is one distinction where there's an actual dichotomy between being a boy and a man, and you can admire the one for doing more than what might otherwise be expected of him. That this still doesn't imply that a 14-year-old boy is inferior, or that a 13-year-old girl or a 10-year-old girl, or even an infant girl, is inferior to a man. But anyway, there was no denigration whatever intended by the newscasters, or the generals, or the commanding officers talking about my boys, uh, there was no denigration intended, and there was none taken. And here is a distinction between men and women, one that would actually serve you well in life. Uh, it would actually go some way uh, in the way of helping you dis disprove the theory, the idea that women are overly emotional. The boys, in, those, in that case, weren't getting all wrapped around the axle because they were called boys, rather than men. And indeed, they would even talk about the distinction between their having gone there as 18-year-old boys and in a couple of days having become 18-year-old men. No biological fact happened that changed them from being boys to men. They're talking about a mental state. And they certainly weren't saying, oh my god, on Monday I was inferior, but today I'm totally superior. It just does not happen. 
that's not the way that men think. And we are perfectly capable of dealing with this without taking it as some invidious slight on our standing in society, because we're not overly emotional. You, on the other hand, seem to have a different cast of mind. Call men boys, because it's demeaning and emasculating. And are there women who don't mind being seen as... De Since masculinity deals with things related to boys and men, being called a boy can't be emasculating because they think that men should be in charge and that they should be tender and delicate? Of course. And there are all kinds of men and women, and I promise that's okay. But to these women, I would say the following. There is a thing that happens when we grow up in the kind of male-centered culture that we live in. We start to believe that the way things are is the way they have to be. We start taking on the... There is, such as I'm aware, n no person who, outside of an institution who is of the view that the way things are is the, is the way that they have to be, that it's just not possible to change things. I suppose maybe Professor Pangloss, you know, um, in order for change to be possible, it must either be possible for what is not to be or for what is not to be. Therefore, change is not possible. You know, that kind of, that kind of a notion which is meant to be satirical. So outside of those situations and the authors who are conjuring it up or people who are in uh, mental institutions, there aren't people running around, running around believing that change is impossible and that the way things are is the way that, the, the, is the way that things must be. You're just talking out of your, well, who knows what orifice. Biases and judgments of women, which have been in place since an historical time when women weren't respected or even... I'm reminded of a, of a woman whom I, whom I admire, Eleanor Roosevelt who has some wise words for uh, fragile little creatures like yourself. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. One of the things about being a guy is that we are capable of going about our lives without hearing you know, someone call us boy and think that we have been denigrated. And why? Because we don't consent to that notion. Whereas you not only consent to, but propound the proposition that girls are inferior to men and boys. This is a proposition with which I strenuously disagree, and I would suggest that if you truly care about empowering women, you will knock off this kind of nonsense and change your view, not because of linguistic conventions, but change your view about the standing of women in the world, because your view is the one that is a uh, skew. Loud into the public sphere. Oh, and uh, another thing about language there, talking about empowering women. This notion in and of itself demeans women for the simple fact that it implies, by its terms, in so many words, uh, that they lack a certain kind of power. This is a false proposition. Um, people, the only people who require being empowered externally are people who, in fact, do not have the ability to do it themselves. And this notion that women are just too weak, helpless, and stupid to uh, see to their own affairs and work in their own better interests is perhaps true of feminists, but it's not true of women uh, generally, at least not the ones I know, and certainly not any woman uh, I respect. Uh, well, I guess that tells you where you stand with me. Go on. The terms we're using for women are outdated and insensitive, and they assume a structure of power where men are on the top and women are on the bottom. And here we have the entire enterprise of interest here. It is about power for this one. It's a poor thing. By the way, when I refer to a straight boy who's actually like a 25-year-old guy, is that demeaning him? Because, you know, he's straight, which means patriarchy, power, but I say boy, and apparently that makes him inferior now. Uh, I don't know how the, the intersectionality of these two modalities might work itself out in the lived experience of men in the world. But do you think that maybe they're just, uh, that their absolute value is such that they, they just do categorically cancel each other out and that just makes them normal? Do you think maybe? In certain eras and in certain parts of this country and the world, this kind of thinking has persisted for far longer than it should have. And we know better now. It's up to us to change this narrative. We know better now, by which she means I feel strongly now. Uh, you know what? Actually, I think I'm just going to leave it there because there's not a lot else that comes out of her mouth that's really worth responding to. I think I covered all the, the major points. Um, except to say, I'm always disappointed when a scientist goes around 
propounding these nonsense notions of the soft so-called sciences and pretending as though it's science when it really isn't. The conjecturing of some people from some years ago that hasn't borne itself out in reality as logically dubious as incompatible with evolution and indeed defies experiments that the people within the field have conducted to test the hypothesis. Uh, going around proposing this as science really denigrates science and it really annoys me that a person who spent so much of her life studying uh, such a noble field and uh, going after such a noble endeavor would, would so callously and easily uh, slander it. You know, putting that off to the side. Have a great day.